Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm David Arditi, and I'm an associate professor of sociology and the director of the Center for Theory. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the College of Liberal Arts, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, the Department of English, the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, and the Office of the Vice President of Research. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Beth Ann Shelton for our chair of the sociology department and Dr. Sonia Watson, who's the uh, associate dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Provost Tech Lin for being in, in attendance today. In the 2017-18 school year, the Center for Theory hosted a colloquium series on digital culture. The colloquium turned into an edited volume called The Dialectic of Digital Culture, which is right here, and a great picture of it right here, um, that was edited by myself and Dr. Jennifer Miller. Um, and we also have two other author contributors, Dr. Amy Spear and Dr. Timothy Morris. All are contributors to this volume. Um, I think my keys are canceling out the microphones. So a little about the book. What my plan here today is I'm gonna talk a little bit about the book and then I'm going to turn it over to each one of the authors and they will give you three to five minutes about their particular chapters, and then I will lead the roundtable discussion with questions, and then I will open it up to the audience to respond to, to give us some questions too. So if you think of something, you can write it down, or I'm okay with you just interrupting us and saying, hey, I got this question. So we're good if you do that as well. Um, so the whole idea of the dialectic of digital culture surrounds this idea called the digital dialectic. And to give you an idea first of what a dialectic is, uh, dialectic is a research method that explores the contradictions inherent in concepts. So it's inherent already in the concept. The best I can think of is wealth poverty as a, as a dialectic. The wealth poverty dialectic is the idea that you can't even have a conception of wealth without a conception of poverty. And any time, um, MSNBC always does this uh, global citizen where they wanna end global poverty, and that sounds like a great thing. I'm all about ending global poverty, but the problem is you can't end global poverty without ending wealth. And the second you start raising that question, I guarantee most of the people that want to end poverty all of a sudden say, oh, I'm okay with poverty in that respect. Um, so that's another conversation, but that's the idea of the dialectic, that these things are intrinsically linked and can't be without each other. Uh, kind of a more reductive would be like light-dark. How can you think of something being light if you don't have the concept of dark in your head? So the digital dialectic is the progressive optimism that society holds about digital technology, that the internet and communication technologies will bring us democracy, freedom, and equality, the three pillars of the Enlightenment. And all of this happens through scientific rationality. This dialectical reading that we do in the book of digital technology and social media suggests that technology can be used as a force to promote social justice or it can be used to reinforce existing power structures. Even more, it notes that these possibilities exist simultaneously and in constant tension within digital culture. We suggest that the de democratic and democratizing potential of digital culture should not be viewed as an either or, but rather a both and. So although digital technology promises democratization of information and the free flow of ideas, these promises are often betrayed when digital technology is used for anti-democratic ends, including surveillance, oppression, and domination, among others. So when we think about technology, we often attempt to imagine that it is created in a vacuum of its own mind. 
However, people create technology and people use technology. So for me, culture is the process through which people make meaning out of everyday things. Anybody that's taken my class before knows, especially pop culture, I, I jam this into people's heads. Um, at the moment that someone creates a technology, they place their cultural understandings within it. So technology is always already cultural. It can, it's always embedded in culture. So then as we begin to use the technology, we again place our cultural meanings into that. For instance, I don't know if y'all have seen these things. Um, if you look at recorded sound, so on the left here we have Edison's first phonograph. It, it used to be cylindrical instead of having a disc. Um, and on the right, we have the famous RCA Victor um, logo, which is a dog looking into a gramophone going, huh? <laughs> and the idea here is that it's his master's voice. So many of you have probably seen this, but never thought about the fact that the tagline is his master's voice. Um, so if you look at recorded sound, it didn't descend from the sky. Instead, initially, people used the phonograph to record people's voices so that after they passed away, their voices could survive. So in the late 1800s, the whole idea was you took a photograph of somebody and that photograph, you kept them forever stored. They wanted to do the same thing with sound. Uh, of course, um, Alexander Graham Bell didn't like deaf people and that was kind of part of what he was doing as well, but that's another story. They wanted to record sound. Um, and of course, this is not why we use recorded sound today. We use recorded sound mainly to listen to music, maybe to hear this thing played back over YouTube or something. Um, but even if the tension between live music and recorded music, there used to not be the concept of live because there wasn't the concept of recorded. Again, these things are dialectic in their relationship. Um, so to begin the conversation, I'd like to think about some new technologies and the way these contradictions appear. So first, we have Twitter and Facebook. And if you remember back to 2009, 2011, we get the Arab Spring, what's known as the Arab Spring, and the Occupy movement. And in both of these cases, technologists, the news media discussed the way that uh, this was going to bring democracy. People were going to start coming together and rising up and overthrowing the system using Twitter. Well, but that's not really what happened. You know, it takes people to do something, and people immediately kick back, and what we actually found was NYPD during the Occupy movement was uh, tapped somehow into Facebook groups, and people that were using Facebook groups that were private, all of a sudden police officers were showing up at their uh, meetings and stuff. So then you get the 2016 election, you get fake news and disinformation campaigns by foreign governments, Nobody sitting here in 2019 is probably as enthusiastic for Twitter and Facebook to bring us democracy as they were in 2009. So these, these are the kind of tensions. Another example is the ring doorbell. So the great thing about a ring doorbell, and I won't poll the room about how many people have them, um, the great thing about the ring doorbell is you know when a package is delivered. If Amazon puts something on your package, or on your door step, not on your package, <laughs> um, you might have packages stacked. Um, but at any rate, you know when something arrives there. And when you get that package, you can then have a record of when uh, it, it arrived, and if somebody stole it, you have their mug on your ring doorbell. This is the goal of everyone. However, it's also got to be known that Amazon purchased Ring, so they have a benefit in maintaining the safety of your stoop so that people aren't stealing Amazon packages. Uh, but then Ring and Amazon coordinated an effort with police departments across the country 
so that in a lot of communities, I, I think there's 2,000 communities at this point, um, they can just request rings cameras and within a half mile radius of wherever the crime happened, they can get like 10 minutes either side of the event immediately into their uh, police departments. And so while my neighbor across the street might have a ring doorbell and might care for his um, safety of his suit, I don't really care that much. And the fact of the matter is, is that they can now have a camera pointed at my house. So if I accidentally walk across my kitchen naked for some reason, and the window blinds open, then everybody can see, and it's recorded and forever out there. So, you know, privacy is something I care about, and ring is something that really takes away our privacy. Um, the final one that I want to talk about before getting to my panelists, uh, and something happened with the word neutrality there, is net neutrality. Net neutrality is the principle that individuals should be free to access all content and applications equally, regardless of the source, without internet service providers discriminating against specific online services or web websites. This, to me, is necessary and lacking today. Um, but if we think about it dialectically, then we have to ask the question, what is missing? And what's missing in discussions of uh, net neutrality is whose interest is served. So for me, critical thinking is thinking against power. And when you think against power in this instance, who's supporting net neutrality? Well, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Netflix, all Silicon, many Silicon Valley companies said, yeah, net, net neutrality, and they supported it. And one of their basic arguments was that net neutrality allows it so that there can be the next Netflix. Because without net neutrality, then an ISP could restrict an uh, internet company from having access to the broadband, they have to pay a large fee that they don't have, so they can't get on. Um, and that's right, and a reason to support net neutrality, but it also, they got on board because it maintains the status quo. And what I think we need is a vision of network neutrality that goes beyond the pipes. So this is often how it's described, right? Like a highway. So you've got the fast lanes, just like many cities have hot lanes, high occupancy toll lanes, uh, that if you pay a fee, you can get onto them. So that's the idea here behind net neutrality. But I think that we need to think further about network neutrality and think in terms of one in which search engines do not restrict content, one in which we have the opportunity to alter the algorithms to access the content we want, and one in which information eclipses commodities. So, that's the kind of overview of the book, and now we have three of the authors, and I'll reintroduce them, and I'll give them in the order that I have them here, which is not the order that they're sitting. Um, so we have Dr. Jennifer Miller, and she'll be, she'll tell you a little something about queering the straight world, mommy blogs, queer kids, and the limits of digital advocacy. Next we'll have Timothy Morris, uh, who will present his chapter entitled Photography, Bibliography, Digitality, Paradox. And finally, we'll have Dr. Amy Spear, uh, who will present From the Wild West to Silicon Valley, Shifting Models of Reproductive Medicine in North America. So uh, each will have a few minutes, and I will turn it now over to Jennifer Miller. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Oh, I have to use this. OK, there's many microphones. Hello? Is this on? You can hear me? Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to present a little bit from my chapter. As David mentioned, it's Queering the Straight World, Mommy Blogs, Queer Kids, and Digital World Making. I'm really interested in advocacy, activism, and the kind of democratizing possibilities for giving people a platform that exists because of internet technologies. But my background's in cultural studies, particularly Frankfurt School Cultural Studies, which makes me a consummate skeptic. <laughs> and so even though I do want to hold on to this idea of hope and approach blogging and approach advocacy and activism online, 
openly, I kind of take a model I call critical optimism to think through the kind of advocacy initiatives and how they pan out. My chapter is a case study of a woman named Lori Duran's blog. It's a mommy blog called Raising My Rainbow. She, Lori Duran turned to the internet in around 2009 when the medical establishment failed to provide her with really positive feedback on her gender non-conforming child, at the time a four-year-old. She went to her pediatrician and was like, I need some advice. I'm not really sure. Should I allow my child to wear skirts? Should I allow him to play with Barbies? And the pediatrician said, well, let's send you to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist was about as useful as the pediatrician was and came up with a really um, punitive model of care instead of a celebratory model of care and affirming model of care, which was what Lori Duran was looking for. As a result, she decided she had to be the expert on her own child because the existing traditional experts had failed her. To do this, she of course went to the same place we all do, online, <laughs> okay? And, and I do think that one of the positives about these online digital environments is it does allow average people not necessarily to become experts, once you become an expert, you realize that that's an important designation to reserve for certain people, <laughs> but to certainly become far more well-researched than before the internet age. So she begins to research gender nonconformity, gender fluidity, and really create her own model of care that celebrated her child. In 2011, she decided to start blogging about it. And that's why, you know, it's a case study of her work as a mommy blogger. So I'm doing close readings of the contradictions inherent in her desire to create a world for her queer child and her attachments to heteronormativity, to white privilege, to her middle class identity, the things that enabled her to claim a platform and a voice in the first place. So I'm looking at a lot of different tensions and contradictions dialectically, but I also think that what you can find is a lot of hope right now, particularly in mommy blogs, but not just in mommy blogs. I think we want the world to change. <laughs> I think that, and that's one of the things that I think that if you look closely at a lot of activism and activist work online, advocacy work, you get a sense that people really do want something, even if they can't articulate what it is. So that's what I'm doing in my project. Of course, we can answer more questions during Q&A, but I'll pass it along to Dr. Morris now. Thanks. <laughs> my, my contribution to this collection is historical in some ways, and I'm coming to realize that I, I'm, I'm sort of living history now, I'm, I'm often <laughs> Uh, the oldest or, or nearly the oldest person in a room, which is kind of fun to talk about this new stuff, and, and I'm quite an old person. About about uh, a little over 20 years ago, uh, we were getting computers for the English department, and uh, our, our uh, chair at the time uh, uh, was holding some kind of discussion over email. We all had email. Uh, by then, and, and I, I said something in the email exchange like, oh, "I've been using computers for for 25 years now," and and he he wrote back to the discussion. He said, "How old are you? <laughs> 25 years? How could you be?" But it is true. Uh, in the early 1970s, uh, my my father worked at the University of New Jersey, and, and they had a computer with with a phone modem. Uh, it was just a just a teleprinter, and and you you took the phone modem and, and you turned you know, people don't even know what these phones look like, right? And you turned the phone upside down in, into the into the modem, and it connected to a mainframe computer in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and you could type in Star Trek game and play it against the computer in New Brunswick from South Jersey, where where we live. This was a cool game. All you had to do was fire photon torpedoes and those one. Uh, but uh, that's how long I've been using computers. And, and so I, 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 what I did for this book was uh, uh, to talk about my experiences over 20 years ago, compiling a bibliography for the web. Uh, this, uh, you know what bibliographies used to look like? These would be books. 
and 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 people would would just spend years compiling this stuff on note cards and alphabetizing it, and, and then at the end of the day, you had your print bibliography, which led you to various books and articles on a given topic. And uh, about 20 years ago, a little bit over 20 years ago, some of us uh, pioneers in this field were were thinking we could do this we could do this on a website. Wouldn't that be amazing? And, and so we took out all of our old note cards and and and. Uh, you know, designed web pages and some primitive type of, of navigation and uh, uh, presented the same material that you would have found in a print bibliography, but you presented it on, on web pages and all of a sudden it was it was live, it was it was instantly updatable, it, it, you could add to it, you could, you could move it around. Of course, what you couldn't do with the type of thing I was designing in the late 1990s was what you can do today with, with our library catalog, which is just uh, search something and instantly you get 79 million results from all over creation, which are completely undigested and, and often completely incomprehensible. Uh, so my contribution was simply a kind of a, 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 a history of web bibliography in some ways, from days when it emulated print bibliography to a, to a kind of a a very fruitful and creative period, as I saw it early on, to a later era that I'm more disenchanted with, where where the, our function as bibliographers is taken over by machines and, and algorithms, and the material you get when you do a search now, you think you've found all the information on something, is more useless than a print bibliography ever was in some ways. I also have some analogies to the history of photography, but my time is up here, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Spears. Mm -hmm. uh, so first, I want to thank uh, our Dr. Ardidi and Miller for including me in this book. And we presented last week in San Francisco, and now we're here at home. Um, so I'm a medical anthropologist, and my research over the past 10 years has been on cross-border reproductive care. And that means that people are traveling abroad for um, assisted reproductive technologies. So when I say assisted reproductive technologies, I mean in vitro fertilization, surrogacy, egg donor, sperm donor. Um, and so my previous research looked at North Americans who were traveling to the Czech Republic for IVF using egg donor because it was much cheaper. Um, and then I foolishly possibly decided, why don't I look here at home? And so people are traveling from 79 different countries to the United States seeking out IVF um, with egg donor and or surrogacy. And so I do ethnographic research, so it's a bit strange that it's such a large industry. This fer fertility medical industry is called the baby business in the United States because it's a very much for-profit industry. And so I've been trying to trace international fertility journeys from people that are coming from China, Australia, and all over Europe and coming to the United States. And so Imagine that you are a single man in Australia and you want to have a child. You kind of don't have all the parts you need. And so what is the process like? I mean, so usually they're Googling um, fertility clinics or Googling surrogacy agencies. And there are 500 clinics in the United States and there are hundreds of egg donor agencies and surrogacy agencies. So just imagine trying to navigate this terrain, but the centrality of the internet and digital technologies in terms of um, making relationships with your surrogate or with a fertility endocrinologist or you know, finding a surrogacy agency. So you may come from Spain, you may end up hiring a surrogacy agency in Portland, Oregon. You may have an egg donor in Los Angeles, and then your surrogate may be in North Carolina. And the fact of this multi-jurisdictional aspect of international fertility journeys is because of the internet and because of all of that. And so I'm interested in how um, digital technologies are central to this trade, this global trade, and some of the ethical issues and contradictions 
um, that are involved with not just reproductive technologies, but also using the internet to find a surrogate, for example. So that's my chapter. Well, thank you all. I think my microphone's a lot louder. Yeah. Than the other. <laughs> uh, and I just tend to be a louder person. Um, Tim, when you were talking, you mentioned um, algorithms and the way that when we run our library search, uh, it's kind of all left up to the algorithm. And it doesn't have that personal tailoring that you provided in these bibliographies. But th this is kind of one of the tensions that I like to think about that as far as the book. The algorithms that the libraries use are produced by people. And the people that are helping produce those algorithms are librarians. And it's the librarians and the way that they sort information. So I, my mind is always blown when I go into the library and I, then I say, I'm trying to search for X. Right? And they can go, oh yeah, they, they find this because they know the magical terms, right? Whereas I just type in the words and something pops up and it's completely mystified to you. Um, but I'm wondering if the algorithm that gives you your return that's not as good as what you provide, it's just a different way of ordering things in a way um, that kind of hides in a black box from the end user. Um, so the kind of decisions that are made are maybe not by experts, but the way data science operates, so inf or information science, information science librarians. So what do you think about that? I should use this. Mm -hmm. I? Yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah, I think there are, there are trade-offs. I wonder how, how much thought anybody puts into certain uh, search algorithms, bibliographical search algorithms. From what I see in some of these library uh, search algorithms, they put no thought into it at all. No, uh, I, I can't imagine any librarian is, is guiding some of them uh, because the answers are, are frequently nonsensical, uh, particularly not even being able to find reliably what your library actually holds which is now almost impossible to do with, with, uh, with library catalogs, it's bizarre. So I don't, I don't know about that. Well, anyway, but, but uh, there may be some librarians here who can, who can clarify these things. Uh, but there are trade-offs, obviously. One of the, one of the things about a, you know, an individual craft bibliographer, you might say, is, is that they're, they're gonna have good knowledge of the field, but they're, they, you're one person, you, you, can't, you can't find everything. And, and uh, so, you know, some of these search algorithms can, can find Billions of things, and you, you've never even you never even know what what is out there. Um, so it, there there is a trade off there. What what you lose in in depth, you you uh, you gain in in uh, breadth or or whatever. But but there there is also this this weird sense. I think for a lot of users, I mean maybe people can relate to this. If you go to Google or something and and, and you type in your term, and then you know everything. Most of us are, are, are very satisfied that, that the first page of Google exhausts all information um, in the world. And, and that can seem so on Google because the next 49 pages look exactly like the first page. Just, it's it just kind of, it's kind of weird. Uh, I, I don't, I'll leave it at that, but maybe others will have. Yeah. Um, since you have the microphone, I'm gonna follow up on that. Um, so when I read your essay, I couldn't help but think about blogs. So you described the way that you developed your online bibliography in the 90s. Um, around the time you started this project, a plethora of different folks around the world were doing similar things in effect web logging websites. Uh, I think that they had a kind of different perspective on it than you, but essentially the same thing, finding information out there and attaching HTML tags to it to, to link the websites. Um, so what relationship do you see, if any, between your own work and the development of blogs? Do you think of yourself as an early blogger? Uh, no, or, or yes and no. <laughs> and, and this, this uh, it, uh, I may redirect this question a little because I, I find it very interesting in that uh, I was, 
deliberately trying to emulate print uh, bibliography, except just make it easier to use and and and, uh, and faster and, and uh, more to <coughs> see. People who uh, did web blogs twenty odd years ago, uh, it, it was quite a specific thing. You you found something on the web. And you kept a daily record of what you found, and you commented or maybe didn't on, on interesting stuff. A lot of stuff on early blogs, you know, was just like a link. Here's this, and and uh, it, it was idiosyncratic. It, it was it was uh, a very often unthemed. Uh, uh, one one of the people I, I emulated uh, uh, early on was was uh, Rebecca Blood, who was to this blog was just whatever interested her called Rebecca's blog. It didn't even have a, a theme like, like some of the, the blogs that, that Jennifer talks about here. And I think over the decades, what has happened to blogs is that it's, without meaning to, become an emulation of what used to be a, a print columns in mm -hmm. periodicals. So people are not really, they may not even be a pretext to link to anything anymore. Your blog is simply your, your online journal or, or more crafted ones are, are like columns used to be. Except that nobody pays for journalism anymore, so so we just all put it up on the web for free. Uh, which is is it's interesting the way in which some of these things, which were, were kind of radical twenty years ago, now look more like things that existed forty years ago. If that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep the theme of blogging going. Um, so Jennifer, in your essay, you discuss how blogs are site of world fame. And as a blogger yourself, a world famous blogger, um, how do you see your role as someone making a world? And how do you think other bloggers could be more conscious about the world they construct online? OK, that's an interesting question. So the tension that I'm looking at specifically in my book chapter is what happens when cisgender heterosexual parents of queer kids are the queer world makers? You can see how that might be problematic, I imagine, right? So one of the critiques I make of Lori Duran, as much as I really appreciate her work, um, she is reproducing a lot of power hierarchies without acknowledging her own position of privilege in ways that are very problematic. And I think in general, it's always a useful place to start with self-reflection and think in terms of what allows me to amplify my own voice at a particular moment. She's able to amplify her voice partly because of her race and class privilege. She appropriates an ideal motherhood script on the blog repeatedly, which is one of the dynamics I explore in the chapter. I keep pointing to the book if you want to buy it and go for it. I think we have like coupon codes. But uh, so this is really what interests me. My own blog, I started about 18 months ago, two years ago. It's called RaiseThemRighteous.com. And what I do is kind of bibliographic work to a certain extent. My main research area is LGBTQ plus children's picture books. And so what I do on my blog is try to create an archive of texts. I've reviewed over 125 of these books. And you know, a lot of people, educators, librarians, parents, that's who my audience is going to be, weren't aware of these texts. So it's kind of like, yes, everything's available online and you can purchase them all from Amazon but none of them are going to come up in a tertiary kind of Amazon search, right? So I'm, I see this as very public facing intellectual work that's meant to make an intervention on bookshelves. And that's how I see myself as kind of building a world by building opportunities for more people to become aware of these texts. Um, when it, and so again, you know, there's so many different kinds of bloggers, but when it comes to the mommy bloggers specifically, I do, I think it's useful to reflect on those points of privilege and just think a little bit more critically about what you're putting into the world. Yeah. So, this question is for you, Amy. Okay. Um, one of the reasons, one of the ideas behind this roundtable is uh, relating to the strategic in initiative of the university, data-driven discovery. And there's many different ways we could think about the way digital technology leads to data-driven discovery. And Amy, your essay, I think, 
falls at the intersection of two new digital technology data sources. Uh, so on the one hand, you've got digital networks, and on the other hand, you have reproductive technologies. Mm -hmm. And I mean, essentially mapping the human genome is one huge data project uh, that would not be possible without big data. And while you didn't write about reproduction technologies themselves, I was hoping you could expand on some of the ethical issues that we need to address as DNA technologies advance. So you heard much discussion about uh, some of the from the providers about lines they would not cross or lines they have crossed. Um, what are some of these ethical issues that you've come across in your work? I mean, there's a minefield of them, but um, I guess I, I would want to talk about egg donor um, anonymity in particular. So a lot of people who need to have egg donor um, don't necessarily want to share that information. And so the ethical question is, um, do, you, do you share with your child that's born through IVF that he or she is from an egg donor, or do you not? And a lot of people opt for anonymous egg donation. And um, increasingly, there's clinics and fertility clinics and surrogacy agencies and egg donor agencies who are pushing for less anonymity, right? So you have in um, some countries like Germany and Austria, you have access to the identity of your egg donor at the age of 18. And there's some people that are pushing for that model. So you can know your egg donor, have a relationship, or have their contact information if your child would so want it eventually. And then there are some people who are pushing for even like a more flexible model. So um, your child can find out at age six or 10 or 13, how do you know what the right age is for them to know or have access to their egg donor information? Another issue is about, can you even promise anonymity at this point? Because all of these egg donor databases are online. You can create a username and password and search egg donor egg databases, and you have access to a lot of photos. Mm -hmm. And so we don't know what the potentiality is for these egg donors who are being told your identity is being protected, and it may not be. And you also have new websites that are coming up, like the donor sibling registry, where you'll have a child born of sperm donation and they can seek out and find their 40 siblings <laughs> across the globe, right? So, so there's so many of these technologies that are being used, but we still don't know the potentiality of even you know, anonymity, whether you disclose to your child and whether you can protect an egg donor. It's privacy, does that make sense? Yes. So there have been a string of articles over the past few years by technologists that say something to the effect of, we need someone to study the social side of technology. And then all of the science and technology studies and digi digital humanities folks reply, we are. <laughs> this was a couple months ago, this huge flap, I think it was in New York, the New York Times, somebody wrote something like that. And everybody that I follow on Twitter is like, this is what we do, read our work. Um, so I think that one of the big takeaways from the dialectic of digital culture is we are, we are talking about these things. Uh, so for instance, one of the other chapters uh, is about the ecological footprint calculator um, and the way that this kind of, this becomes this thing that people feel like they're doing something, but you're still polluting. There's no getting rid of the pollution once it's put out there. There's ways you can mitigate it, but then there, this isn't regulated by governments or anything. So it becomes this feel good thing. Um, so how do you, this is open to all three of you, um, how do you think people from the humanities and social sciences can contribute to public discussions and policy debates about new technologies. And to, to kind of add on to that, it's sexy to say, look at this new gadget I invented. 
look at all the things we can cure with, right? Um, but no one wants to hear someone say, that gadget will kill humanity. <laughs> and everyone hates a critic. I mean, that's the thing. And, uh, what do you do about that, right? So how do we provide important critique while maintaining excitement about what we have to say, not like buzz kill? I'll dive in. I, I mean, the field of surrogacy and assisted reproductive technologies, there are a lot of scholars who take the buzzkill, um, <laughs> the killjoy feminist critical approach to it. Um, and personally, myself, I mean, I, I'm not speaking to the public how we can contribute to policy, but I'm much more comfortable with ambiguity. Mm -hmm. and by being critical and examining many multiple sides of the potentialities, but also the drawbacks of reproductive technologies. Or So I'm not just going to be Gloria Steinem, which she did a few months ago, decrying surrogacy in New York where they're trying to legalize it. And I'm like, eh, I, I'm a feminist, of course, and I just saw Gloria Steinem last week, but um, I'm much more ambiguous in terms of this is a really great way for gay parents to have children. And this is a beautiful way you know, to give people opportunity who maybe didn't have it prior to assisted reproductive technologies. <coughs> Yet at the same time, they cost a lot of money and are problematic. So that's my own personal way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can, you repeat the, can you repeat the question? How do you think people from the humanities and social sciences can contribute to public discussions and policy debates about new technologies? And how can we like maintain excitement without sounding like curmudgy people that hate technology, that hate Luddites or something like that? Well, I don't hate technology, certainly. I think I, Dr. Spears' approach makes sense, right? There is nuance. Things are problematic, but they're also potential, right? Like there's problems and there's potential. So one of just in all of my work right now, I'm trying to theorize this idea I mentioned briefly of critical optimism, where we take critical thinking and we look at the problems and pitfalls, but we also recognize to make change in the world, you have to put imperfect things into the imperfect world, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I feel like that's been fairly well received because we know it, I think, in a very kind of organic way that if we, we're not going to have a radical revolution next weekend, but we can make critical conscious decisions and also understand the limitations of those in our given moment, right? So you negotiate the context you're given towards a better context, my thought. Yeah, I, I think humanities, uh, I think has a role in in this uh, problem that that uh, uh, it it can address by being historical uh, and and uh, reminding people that that perhaps certain problems have been faced before. Uh, there there's a, a kind of half baked idea floating around recently that's gained a lot of traction that that is. Uh, the way people read in digital media nowadays is changing our minds. So like, like that's changing, rewiring our brains. Particularly that you're reading a book was good. Scrolling through text is bad. You've heard this argument because you, you can't you can't, you know, scrolling can be resized and, and, and reshaped and it, it, it goes past you. And pages were good because you could remember where something was on a page and it would always be fixed on the page of a, of a book like that. And well, okay, I don't know, I don't, I don't think brains evolve that quickly. Uh, it's only a few years here, and I don't know, not even a generation. Well, well, I don't know, I'm not, a, I'm not a neurologist, but then you think, well, wait a second, Aristotle used to scroll through text on scrolls. That's where it comes from. <laughs> you know, was he some kind of dummy because he was scrolling through something rather than having a codex? You know, a book we call codex like that. You know, so you got to you got to kind of maintain maybe some some perspective, and that's where people, the humanists, come in on on, on, uh, on certain ideas that, that float up from time to time. So. Uh... 
Something that I couldn't help but think about is that the internet lends society to a greater degree of mobility. And actually mobility kind of in this, the same way. One of the things that freaks me out a little bit is driverless cars. Uh, and having algorithms decide whether or not a person dies. And then, right, like, if there's three people walking and over there and one over there and the car's got to go somewhere, a computer programmer somewhere made the decision about how that, is, that car will react uh, in that situation. Um, and not to get into philosophical discussions of ethics, uh, that's not what I'm here to do, but they just freak me out for that reason. But I also recognize that there's a lot of people with mobility issues that can't drive a car. And a driverless car also brings them a lot of freedom in their ability to move around the world, especially in a place with a car culture like the United States, especially in Arlington, Texas. Right? How do you get from point A to point B? Um, but mobility comes up again and again. And so what I'm wondering is, how do you all think uh, the internet breaks down barriers of space? He has the mic. <laughs> all right, I, I was, I, I was going to digress about driverless cars. No, no, no. <laughs> Maybe I should do that while the others are thinking of something more, more relevant to say. In fact, driverless cars are, are fascinating because, again, to take a historical approach, the roads we take for granted today, <coughs> paved roads, the things that have been around for uh, 125, 130 years, and were originally uh, designed in many, many cases uh, for bicycles. That, that was the leading edge of it, because bicycles were, were pretty bad on, on old uh, dirt roads. Uh, obviously, automobiles then, then evolved in, in, in uh, tandem with, with uh, paved roads. But this driverless car uh, initiative, not much of it is directed towards infrastructure or, and then towards community or politics. What's happened instead is, is that, again, this dependence on algorithms, you, you get uh, inventors trying to design a car that will deal with the crappy roads we have now. Rather, rather than say, as, as early cyclists and early automobile enthusiasts did, we gotta redesign roads or we can't get anywhere. The idea is we're, we're going to turn over to, to algorithms the ability to cope with, as you fear, absolutely every crazy thing that could happen on a road or road surface or, or anything. And uh, again, I, I think there's, I mean, who knows what will happen with this, but there, there is this, there is this uh, both faith that we can overcome anything through algorithms and produce a perfectly mobile society. And uh, a faith that, that we can do that without making certain community decisions about uh, about improving, uh, you know, basic community infrastructure. That's my idea there. And now for more relevant answers. <laughs> That's kind of your thing. Mm -mm. Mobility. <laughs> <laughs> What's the question again? <laughs> How does the internet create uh, greater mobility by breaking down barriers? space so I mean of course the dissemination of knowledge is happening you know being disseminated quite quickly um, and also just cross-border reproductive care people are accessing or just medical travel in general people are able to access medical care that may not be available to them or may not you know there may be regulations against them using them um, so just this fact of people traveling and crossing national borders. So that's breaking down barriers. But at the same time, the people that can come to the United States and afford surrogacy have a lot of money. <laughs> it's about $100,000. And so you used to have reproductive hubs in India and Thailand and Cambodia that were much more affordable for intended parents, but those have recently closed down to international patients. So you have barriers going up with people realizing, oh, there's ethical issues involved. But then you also have a global class structure that's being maintained, whereby if you have the money, then you can access reproductive technologies, which is problematic. So 
At this point, I would like to open it up to the audience for any questions that you might have for anybody. mentioned that back in the day, bibliographies were done by human touch, whereas in modern, it's an algorithm designed by coders with the assistance of librarians. Do you still feel there is a touch of that human touch within the algorithm, or is it purely like cold logic versus the human touch from previous eras? I, I think, should I probably use that? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think what happened, what's happening increasingly, and this is not just in the bibliographical field, but the, uh, the sheer availability of so much information is, is in itself a problem for, for uh, just for, for the user, for, for how, how uh, someone can possibly cope with that in, information. Uh, I, I think that uh, the current search algorithms, again, bi I'm thinking of bi bibliographical terms, are place uh, emphasis on power above everything else, uh, and uh, that uh, the, the more the more the better. Um, the the permutations. I believe I had, had this maybe in the book, but it was certainly in, in the talk I gave at the Center for Theory of of there there are are billions and billions of possible searches one can do in the library's catalog. I'm not sure that that's better than, than 10 or 12. Uh, and and uh, this, this can then be generalized to many another field where we've got way more data than, than anybody could possibly ever look at. And yet we collect it and preserve it and store it, such as in you know, academic assessment or something like that. Why, why are you collecting all this stuff? You never, no human being could ever look at it. <laughs> You're not quite sure what searches will bring what out of it. Anyway, that's, that's another topic. I was going to say, uh, politics has changed quite a bit in the last 10 or 12 years because of the technologies, and uh, specifically with Facebook, uh, it's much easier. I think it's much easier now to create your own little echo chamber, and that's been talked about probably. And some of the newer features like snooze, if you get tired of somebody, you can snooze them for 30 days. And, uh, how is that, do you think, the last few years, specifically Facebook has really maybe increased this idea of creating this own little world of your own and not having to listen to other people's opinions and maybe cause more of this echo chamber mentality? Uh, well, discussions of the public sphere are really interesting in this way, right? Like, the founding of democracy is all about you need an educated citizenry to be able to participate. But if you go all the way back in time with democracy, um, it's always been small. Whether you go back to the Greek democracy or you go back to the colonies, it was wealthy white men, uh, land-owning men that got to participate in the democratic forum. Uh, furthermore, you have the issue of literacy. So as long as people weren't literate, they couldn't participate. Um, so one of the things I, I like to step back and think about with something like Facebook and the kind of circles that you're talking about is it's terrible what's going on, but it's also not new. We've always been embedded in these small spaces, but at least now we get small spaces that are geographically across the world, right? We can dabble in conspiracy theory with people in Australia and, you know, not just our, our neighbors who think that we should have uh, tinfoil hats or something, right? Like, we can engage in these different ways and maybe that's a bad thing. Um, I, I just think it's more that the technologies need to be aware of what they're doing. So where newspapers have always been very cognizant of what's on the front page, what is the message that they're sending out? I mean, I, I looked at Fox News' website today just to see what was going on, because Sondland, uh, the ambassador to Ukraine, was uh, not saying very favorable things about the president. 
Um, but I put it on Fox News, and it was very directed that, oh, you know, he shot a hole in the Democrats' argument, right? So, but that's a conscious thing. What happens on Facebook is they're consciously trying to get money. And they're willing to allow people to fester in whatever uh, stews they want to fester in, just as long as they keep getting people to look at Facebook. Right. Uh, so, is that different than you know Thomas Paine passing around pamphlets back in the 1770s, or you know is it qualitatively different, even though it's quantitatively different? I think these are things that we really have to wrestle with. I don't know if anybody else wants to address that? Yes. So, in a very similar vein to that uh, question. You mentioned earlier um, both the issue of net neutrality and the issue of misinformation with the, the election and everything. So um, I guess my original question before we brought it up was uh, if you could just comment on the mindset shift. Because a lot of people that talk about net neutrality in you know, late 2000s, early teens um, are now the ones saying, like, OK, we need to you know, get a handle on, you know, on misinformation. And I agree, you know, both of those are important. Um, but they're kind of, uh, it, you, you know, they're kind of opposing viewpoints again. You know, where you know, on one hand, it's you know, everybody needs to have a, um, you know, have equal playing field, especially in our um, sort of capitalist, you know, society or whatever. But, um, but on the other hand, you know, we do want to limit stuff that, well, you know, we, we want false information to not be on the same list. So um, my original question was just like. How you you've seen that shift kind of in, in each of your, each of your professions, um, but even just if, if you want to relate it back to that question as well. Well, I, I just don't want to keep jumping on top. One of the interesting things is the, the, because I think you're pointing to an interesting contradiction, right? Um, net neutrality. A lot of people that were proffering net neutrality are what I would call. Uh, cyber libertarians or techno libertarians, right? And the idea that the internet should be free, the in information should be free, everybody should keep their hands off the internet, right? Um, I think that some of the people that came up as, with the concept of net neutrality, specifically Robert McChesney, um, don't think that the internet should be quote unquote free. It's that it should be highly regulated. Um, and that, that regulation should stop bad actors from trying to profit off of it. Um, so kind of on the one hand, you have the techno-libertarians, you also have kind of techno-socialists, and you have uh, neoliberal interests where people are saying, we want to make money, you know, um, keep the government out of it because Verizon should be able to find profit in however they want to. So the, there's kind of these different perspectives and the kind of techno-socialists and the techno-libertarians tend to get along on this. Um, but, but it is interesting to think about the kind of uh, rhetoric that they may or may not use. Um, we are out of time. I would be happy to continue the discussion. I can hang out here. Um, but. I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank my panelists. Um, I'm the director of the Center for Theory, so keep your eye out for things going on in the center. And please, as you leave, take as much food as you want to. There's a t I, I didn't know that the brownies were going to be like half brownie plates each. So y'all have a good one. Thank you.